on the program, it says, I'm Walter Isaacson. It says that I'm moderating it. Kitty actually did a survey of people in Aspen who felt they had not heard me moderate things enough. And it was uh, below the margin of error who felt that way. And when I was editor at Time, every time there was something really important to be done and I didn't quite know what to do, I'd say, Jim, help. <laughs> Can you do it? Jim Kelly was uh, both my partner when I was editor of Time and then took Time to New Heights when he was editor of Time. So he's going to be moderating what is a very interesting panel on what's next for the news business. It's something about which I've had a lot of strong opinions. Unfortunately, I wake up in the morning and I'm not sure I agree with all my strong opinions because it keeps going back and forth on this. I do hope that after a century and a half that was built on copyright where people produced wonderful information that they were rewarded for when people wanted to use it, we can find a way to have another century where people who do produce content that does get copied can have some right to share in that uh, proceeds of that copying. But in the digital age, that's a lot more difficult and perhaps not possible. And with that introduction, I will say we have uh, the best people working on this. As you know, Steve Brill is doing journalism online, which may be the first group to figure out a business model that will work. The secret that I told you about Jim Kelly doing everything that was difficult or important when I was at Time Magazine is not really a secret to Norm Perlstein, who was the one who had then indeed made Jim the editor of Time when Norm got kind of tired of me doing that. And uh, Catherine Weymouth has, uh, the, is the publisher of the Washington Post, is wrestling with this quite a bit. And Michael Kinsley is somebody who, I guess we shared a house in the late 1970s almost in Washington, so we go way back, but has written many articles on this and first tried the model of charging for Slate Magazine and failed. So yeah. he's been there, done that. Right. Jim, all yours. Thank you, Walter. And let me say that uh, your charm has only increased <laughs> since you left Time Inc. Um, <clears throat> we have exactly f uh, 49 minutes to solve the problems besetting the uh, news business. So we're going to start right away. Walter's briefly introduced uh, the panelists. Their full bios are in the, in the uh, information you have. I'm going to start with uh, Catherine Weymouth and ask her, Catherine, how long can you afford to keep giving the post away for free to online readers? Um, I guess I would say for the foreseeable future, we are open to everything. I know Barry Diller, who's on our board, recently gave a speech in which he said content on the web is going to move to a paid model. It just has to, uh, which is most often the argument that I hear in favor of the paid model is, well, what choice do you have? It's not working. You've got to go paid. That's never been our business model, as probably a lot of you know already. 80% of our revenues have always been advertising, and 20% have been paid for by the subscriber. If we could charge online for our content, we would be delighted to. I think our concern is that it would alienate a large segment of the audience, as Michael can attest to. And I worry particularly about the demographics, about the younger kids who I poll sort of informally whenever I run into them, who, for whom it's just alien. So they, they'll pay for music online if they have to. If all news went behind a wall, maybe we could get them to do it. If a couple of newspapers go online or go paid, I think you'd have a situation where a lot of kids would say, you know, I'll just go to CNN or I'll just go to Google News or whatever. So for us, we believe that people pay us with their time. We're seeking engagement online. If we have people who are spending time on our site and reading our news, then the ads will work really well and we'll get more advertisers and we can charge more for them. So your feeling is you can sit this out because obviously things have gotten a lot worse for everyone in the last year. And looking forward, as you say, the foreseeable future, things don't look very much better. Is there any, have you studied, is there any kind of premium content, uh, you, a phrase that I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, that the Washington Post company can come up with and have people subscribe to that while they get most of the paper for free? We are absolutely not sitting anything out. I mean, we are moving aggressively away from being a newspaper organization to being a news organization. And just to give you one example, which I've used but I think it illustrates the point really well. When I took over, we had, for as long as I know, been organized around the sections of the newspaper, a metro staff, a magazine staff, you know, the national staff, and they were all their own little fiefdoms. And a couple weeks into my tenure, I met with the feature section editors who said to me, Catherine, 
is there any, you know, what do you like, what do you not like? And I said, well, let me ask you a question. We had one section which was called Sunday Source, and it was designed for women and young people. And this was on Oscar Sunday. And the New York Times Sunday Style section had what I think women want to read, stylist to the stars. You know, what do they wear, who dresses them? The front of our Sunday Source section was how to plan a funeral. <laughs> and I said, after I dropped the section on the floor of my house, I, mean, I said to them, what were you thinking? And they looked at me completely seriously, and they said, first, well, we thought it was useful information. And I said, well, OK, maybe just put it next to the obits. But then they said, second, and it was much more telling, they said, we thought we couldn't write about that because that's styles. So we've spent the last year, and my, I brought in a new editor that, from the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> Um, no, 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 no. The editor of the section is still there, but I mean an overall editor from the Wall Street Journal who came in and in March sort of blew up the newsroom and reorganized it not around sections of the newspaper but around topics. So, you know, there's national security, there's health, there's education, there's science, and then we have a universal editing desk where you will have editors who will edit it for the web, for mobile, for the newspaper, because we know they're all very different experiences, and I think that's been our mistake, is to assume that they're all just fungible. Now, Norm, you now work at what is, our, I think, is the most successful paid journalism model there is on the web, and that's Bloomberg. Well, it's, it's a paid content model for um, very deep uh, data analytics and news. I don't think it's a model that can be replicated for general um, information at all. We have close to 300,000 people who pay about $20,000 a year to subscribe to the Bloomberg Terminal, and the margins on that, that business are very good, but it's, it's a very narrow slice of even the business um, audience, not to mention a general audience. But is there anything that you've learned at Bloomberg in the last year and a half or so that, that if you had to do things differently at, say, Time Inc., or if you were at the Wall Street Journal still today, that you would apply those lessons to? No. <laughs> um, I think I think Bloomberg is I think Bloomberg is um, really unique. I think that as as much as we spend on editorial, it's a small percentage of our revenues and of our overall expenses. And so, uh, having um, a large business that is really um, uh, based on a great deal of other factors is, is helpful, just as being the Washington Post company and having a big education subsidiary allows you to do things you might not otherwise be able to do, uh, distinguishes you from other media companies. Um, I personally uh, think that for general information, it's extremely difficult to come up with a charging model because most of the people who are online did not grow up reading newspapers, but grew up watching television where information was something that was advertiser supported. And even if they were paying for their cable bill, that was a bundled, um, that was a bundled fee. And there was nobody who was saying, how much am I paying for CNBC or for CNN or for Entertainment Tonight? So you don't think people would pay for the convenience of getting certain kinds of information uh, on a mobile device, for example? Well, they might, but not enough of them to support the kinds of news organizations that are now existing. And I think, I think the two things that people really have to, to look at who, ha who are now uh, providing general information is, is a much more aggressive look at the cost structure to recognize that so much information is ubiquitous and available at a very much lower cost than the news organizations that we've all built and love having around. And secondly, I've been very surprised that most news organizations, as their advertisers have deserted them, have not embraced commerce as an alternative to advertising. Because I think if, if you, why not compete with the advertisers who've left by actually selling stuff to those audiences that are actually coming to your site? Steve? Uh, I think you disagree slightly because you're yeah, engaged in a sounds project. Sounds like I've got a tough job here. Let me, um, <laughs> let me set the scene. I was not being rude when I was looking at this BlackBerry before. Literally four minutes before we sat down, I got an email from uh, someone who had been one of my students at Yale in 2007 
uh, where several years ago we had established um, a program for people who wanted to go into journalism. And it's worked pretty well, unfortunately. We, uh, here's what she said. I was at the Sentinel, the Orlando Sentinel, um, until about two months ago, mainly covering crime. Um, at times it was exhilarating, at times it was highly unpleasant. I learned a lot, mainly about criminal law. But then I had a front row seat at the collapse of a major newspaper, which was sad, but also kind of interesting from an anthropological standpoint. And I think a lot of the publishers' reactions to this are interesting from an anthropological standpoint, too. And then I got laid off in April. It sucked, and I'm still sad, but I think it was probably the best thing that could have happened to me. There weren't any opportunities for advancement at the paper to say nothing of the industry, and I was becoming increasingly disenchanted with the content model the Sentinel was moving towards, sensational and short. She's emailing me because she wants me to write her recommendations to go to law school. That's the world we are in. The second aspect, I'll just give you some snapshots of the world we are in. The only newspapers in the United States or around the world that have seen their circulation increase in the last year are newspapers that charge for their online content. This is a debate about news organizations, as Catherine has so well put it, and that debate is about whether you undermine the value of your print product when you insist on giving it away for free to the next generation. I think you do. I think all the evidence out there is that you do. This is not a debate about putting a paywall down and suddenly everybody who is getting the paper online stops getting it unless they pay. This is a model, at least the model that we are suggesting, involves taking your most avid online visitors and getting from 10% of those online visitors, maybe 5%, maybe 12%, some slice of a payment for some portion of content. Um, what the price is, what the portion is, what the slices are, whether you sample three articles before you charge or 10 articles or five um, is up to the publishers. What we're trying to do is equip the publishers to have the freedom and the ability to redeem the value of their journalism by charging whatever they want across one common password that our hundreds and we hope thousands of um, affiliates will have in common. If it doesn't happen, what I submit to you is not so much that the online model won't work, because it won't, but the print model is going to go away because people are moving from print to online to get their news. Now, um, the issue really is the viability of, of news gathering organizations, and I'm here to tell you the advertising model has never worked. I'll challenge everybody under this tent to name the large scale journalism organization that has ever been able to exist on advertising revenue alone. The 20%, that's a significant 20% because it's 20% and because it redeems the value, it provides value, it yields higher CPMs for advertisers too, by the way. But anyone who thinks that the advertising model alone can work in a world where instead of uh, the broadcast network situation, which by the way the news uh, divisions there still typically didn't make money when there were three of them splitting 92% of the country's eyeballs, to take that broadcast model and say that it's going to work among a trillion websites is just a non-starter. Advertising revenue online will be significant. It will never be the panacea that everybody thought it was. And we're all seeing that today. The CPMs for advertising today online are in some places 10% of what they were a year ago. In some places they're 25%, some places a little more. The, the traditional journalism model has always been that there are two sources of revenue. Now, the one person who thought of this too early is my friend sitting over there, Mr. Kinsley, who is by far the smartest person in the room when it comes to this, which is why I, I shudder at the fact that he's about to disagree with me violently. Uh, I feel but, I'm being set but, up. But Michael, <laughs> no, well, let me just continue the setup Sorry. for a half a second. Um, uh, Michael's only uh, mistake, and it wasn't a mistake, was that he tried this too early before people were used to paying for content online. People are used to paying for content online. Ask Jeff Bezos 
if you don't believe me. Um, and that is the mistake he made with Slate. And again, Slate is not a giant, large news gathering organization, but Slate is a significant news gathering organization, but it feeds off of and uses a lot of other news gathering organizations. The issue here, whether it's the Orlando Sentinel or the Washington Post or the New York Times, there's been a lot of discussion today about this and a lot of smugness about the old media, the old style newspapers, how people have to learn to write to get to the point. Well, if you open up the Washington Post every day, it is a daily miracle of terrific journalism. And that takes money. It also takes, thank God, the dedication of, of the family that has a commitment to it. But for that model to be sustained over the years, it has always relied on two forms of revenue. And I submit to you that it has to continue to rely on that. On that note, Michael, are you, are you really that smart? Um, no, I was, I was spectacularly stupid about this when, I, when we started Slate. I not only wanted to charge, I wanted to charge as a matter of principle. I thought that it was an insult to the writers that, that people would expect to get this stuff for free. And uh, we tried charging. We charged $19, which seemed like a great bargain compared to Time and Newsweek and all the others. And at the end of 11 months, we had 30,000 um, paid subscribers, which didn't even seem that terrible to me. You know, The New Republic and all those magazines are in that area. But um, you know, meanwhile, we had a little front porch where we had 400,000, which in those days was a huge number. So it became evident that we could do better by selling ads to those people who, who were coming to the site rather than, rather than trying to sell subscriptions. And I'm just curious, Steve, what is your theory about why the ad revenue has dried up? Well, it's, it's pretty simple. If I started a fashion magazine today, I'd go to Ralph Lauren and maybe some of the other people in this audience. I'd say, buy ads in my fashion magazine. They'd say, oh, well, there are three others, but yours looks pretty good. Sounds like a deal. What if two people started fashion magazines the next day, and four the day after, and six the day after that? There is infinite inventory online. There is an infinite supply. Now, some of it is worth more than others, but it is that infinite, unending, escalating supply of inventory, plus you know, you know, the worst thing happened is it's accountable. Well, right. It's accountable. If I buy an ad on page 11 of Newsweek, the only thing I know is I put my ad for scotch on page 11 of Newsweek, I, and I know what Newsweek's you know, current circulation is. I have no idea how many people read page 11. I have no idea how many people decided you know, to go buy some scotch because they read yeah. page 11. The opposite is true online. And that has caused advertisers continually to reevaluate how valuable it is, which is a good thing for advertisers, but it's a terribly, terribly competitive world. I mean, he wouldn't like to swim in that world. He's got the best of all worlds. He's got people paying premium, premium, premium for content. It's obviously you can't apply the Bloomberg model anywhere, but you might be able to apply the lesson, which is the oldest lesson in the world for quality media, which is people are willing to pay something for it. That makes advertisers happier. It's a way to get higher CPMs for your advertising when people are paying for it. And it creates a revenue stream that, yeah, the newsroom sort of likes that revenue stream because suddenly uh, they're making their way in the world on the basis of the stuff they're producing not simply on how good their ad salespeople well, are. Well, in fact, as I understand it, um, the fa getting advertisers is the only reason why magazines, for example, charge. But typically, what their subscriptions bring in doesn't even cover the cost of acquiring them, let alone actually delivering the It depends product. on the magazine, well, frankly. I mean, it's... People, yes, ma people, are, ma but, people Magazine makes a lot of money off its yeah, subscription. People Magazine, look at the only successful magazine models out there today. The Economist, I think they well, would right, beg that, to differ that's, with that's, you. That's, that's uh, a special People case. Magazine is, a, is another prime but example. But there are control circulation magazines that are also are profitable. 
And there are websites that do make money with advertising. Um, they, they aren't in the US, but Spiegel Online with an editorial staff of 110 is profitable uh, with an advertising and commerce model. Build uh, is profitable with an advertising and commerce model, spectacularly profitable Norm, with margins. Are they, are they really profitable with honest accounting for Absolutely. the costs? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Spiegel, also... Spiegel staff is totally separate from the magazine. They have nothing in common with these editors. It's a standalone business. They're Michael. also on record right. now as saying that they're considering having some of their content be paid. Again, Michael, your model, uh, you know, uh, the original model you did was uh, you paid, you got it, you didn't pay, you don't get it. That is not the kind well, of sophisticated are, hybrid model that the journal has, for example, that FT has, that all the affiliates we're talking to have. It is not an either or proposition. Well, with business yeah. publications, you can clearly identify content that is of, an, of a type that there's always been an audience that's been willing to pay a premium for. I think you may be able to find with, um, local in certain areas that there will be people who will be willing to pay. I don't think you can blanket say no one will ever pay for anything. Um, uh, I think that local sports, for instance, in a mobile setting may very well be an area of paid. But I think that those are going to be small revenue areas that are not going to pay for the kinds of news organizations that we're now talking about. And I just think it's going to be awfully tough to condition people who grew up not paying co for content to the idea that they should. I mean, this is not about keeping audiences who have been paying and who are, who are giving up the habit. You're really trying to teach people to do well, some new things. Well, let's, let's, let me interrupt for a second. Let's do some role playing here. Steve, you have just been named the publisher of the Washington Post. Yeah. What would you do differently than Catherine? I'm not sure I'd do anything different. From what I know from various discussions, they are completely open-minded about all these alternatives, and, and I think that is exactly where the Washington Post and everybody needs to be. And let me stress, the, the alternatives, again, are not either or. For example, there is a very large newspaper in the UK that has been talking to us that it turns out, like most newspapers in the UK, has a tremendous percentage of their regular, like daily online visitors are from outside the UK, in fact, in the US. These are people who obviously want to read this paper. Maybe there are people who grew up in uh, New Orleans and now live in Aspen and want to read uh, the Times Picayune, okay? So you could do it, one model, one of the different tricks you could try is you charge by, on the basis of whether people are in market or out of market. Another model might be you group together a bundle um, that is you know, everything Washington Redskins or everything, uh, you know, Boston Red Sox, and you charge for that. There are lots of different ways to do this. There are people about to experiment with lots of different ways. My simple answer is there isn't really an alternative. Advertising is not going to be that alternative. Now, I'm not well, saying that every newsroom has to be the same size it is. But Norm? Th yeah. Well, I think it's, I think one thing is that, um, it's clear that the existing models for a lot of media companies are broken and it's going to be very tough to, to resurrect those. I think it's equally clear that it's really early days to be talking about what models will and won't work. I mean, if we were sitting here 10 years ago, America Online would have 50% of the online traffic and we would be talking about companies like InfoSeq and Lycos and Prodigy <laughs> and Genesis um, and uh, Alta Vista, and uh, none of them are around today. Yahoo would be perhaps the one exception, um, and it's unclear what that business will be five years from now. So um, it is worth taking a look at the kinds of things that Amazon is doing, that Plastic Logic is doing, that Kindle is doing, and, and wondering if you have you know, what the future for display advertising will be when you have readers that actually give you easy access to those kinds of ads, whether the, the, the CPMs that we're looking at now, um, you know, may be a function of the ways in which you can access content. So I'd, I'd say that it's, it's very hard sitting up here now to say that there's no model that won't work 
um, for any of these things. And I think that's why you have to be agnostic and try everything. Yes, Michael? Steve, if all you're saying is what Norm just said, that we ought to try everything, I think everyone in this whole well, room I'm would agree to that. that. Well, yes, but so the, the question then is, why do you foreclose part of everything? Why shouldn't, oh, why, shouldn't, why shouldn't the free model work for some the, things? The only the thing I foreclose is the, uh, are, are those who say one of two things, that the toothpaste is out of the tube, we can't do anything, and then their sub point to that is, besides who cares, let's just rely on the wisdom of crowds. That's the only thing I oppose. I think you know, the nonprofit model ought to be tried, and I hope it succeeds. I think anyone who can improve the return on advertising revenue, God bless them, everybody ought to do it. I do think there is a benefit in newspaper publishers and magazine publishers getting together, which is what we're trying to do, to write the balance of power. And the best example is Amazon, which Norm mentioned. Just think about the Amazon model for a second. Right now, Amazon um, you know, makes a deal with a newspaper like the Washington Post that says, this is your lucky day. Um, you can have people sign up for a subscription to the Washington Post. What is it, $5.99 a month, $6.99 a month, whatever it is, $9.99 a month. Great news. A small number of people are signing up. And then Amazon says, it's even a luckier day than that because we're going to give you 30% of the revenue that we get from that. And we're not going to tell you who the customer is. So basically what they're doing to the, trying to do the newspaper industry is what Apple successfully did to the music industry, which is, yeah, we're going to get people to buy this stuff. It's just we're going to control the customer. Now, that is the equivalent of Howard Stringer saying to HBO, because your people watch HBO on a Sony television, I deserve 70% of the revenue, and I deserve that relationship with the customer. But doesn't he go for, even further than that? Amazon retains the right to put that material in other electronic forms? I don't even know. I mean, that it, it could, I mean, that would just add to right. know, the obvious atrocity of the relationship. <laughs> but but it, is, it, 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 it bespeaks the sort of the hangdog situation that the industry is in. Um, listen, I think it's great that there's that alternative. And what we think the model ought to be is that if I'm someone who wants to read the Washington Post, I subscribe to it in print. I subscribe to it online. By the way, we would enable you to get a discount off of your online subscription if you're a print subscriber and vice versa, which has been the single most successful thing about uh, the Dow Jones effort there, is it improved their print revenue. And then I could check another box and say, give me Amazon for another $5. Give me, you know, let me have it on my iPhone. Yeah. For five dollars, let me have it on some device we've never heard of. For five. But the relationship is between Catherine and her customers, not between some hardware makers. We're, we're going to take questions in a few oh, minutes, but I want to first give um, Catherine a chance, and then Michael. Well, can, I, well, can I ask Catherine a question? If 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 you were offered what's thirty percent of one hundred and ten dollars a month, of forty dollars a year, for for all your subscribers, who currently get it on paper. And, and, and you just had to deliver it electronically to, um, to Amazon. Would you take that deal? Well, we're taking it now, but yeah. I think it's not preferable for us. It is not a successful long-term model because there are no ads on Amazon, on the Kindle. But I think the other thing I wanted to say was, I think it's a mistake to think of it as an either-or proposition. Steve is right. We are completely open-minded to all of these models. I think the internet is very much in its sort of adolescence. It's still changing so fast. And, and we are not opposed to doing commerce and uh, enabling our users to book a restaurant or buy a movie ticket or buy a book. And that was something that's changed. I mean, in the old days, if, you, if we wrote a book review and we had said to the editors, can, can we let somebody buy that book? That would have been blasphemy. I think today everybody's like, yeah, it's fine. We're not going to change just, the nature of our book job. review. Just don't yeah. take my job. But part of it, too, is, I mean, the issue is that we've lost our classifieds. That's the issue. So big newsrooms that put out quality journalism are very expensive to maintain. That, so we've lost our classified revenues to Craigslist and eBay and, you know, Auto Trader and you name it. Um, and it is about 
looking at new revenue streams that I, I think if there is a subscription model, I do think it's relatively small revenue. I think transactional revenue is relatively small. We will do all those things, and at the same time, we have to cut our costs. But the ads in the newspaper model, even though you can't measure it like click-throughs, you don't know exactly how many people are looking at which page, they work. I yeah. mean, we get a lot of money from ads in the paper. I mean, it was last summer, right around this time, I was coming back from the, the Democratic National Convention, and I was riding the little people mover for, at Dulles, there was a woman who'd been on my plane and she was with her mother. The first thing she did when she got off the airplane was spend a dollar fifty for the Sunday Washington Post. So I'm watching her, like focus group of one, and she and her mother are frantically paging through the sections, looking for something in there, starting to get frustrated. So I watched for a little bit and then I intervened and I said, can I help you? Or are you looking for something? <laughs> and she acted it's a like new that service was totally of normal. That's right. <laughs> publisher at your service. And um, she said, well, we're looking for the metro section. It's always a second section. I don't understand why it's not here. I get it at home. So I said, well, sometimes it comes in two different sections. Let's look towards the back. We found it, and I stepped back to watch. Do you know what she was looking for? The car wash ad on page B3. Now, the journalists don't like to hear this. There are people who buy our newspaper for the ads or for the comics. We just removed, bravely, two comics that we had massive research. They were the least popular comics for years and years and years, bottom 3%. I had more calls about Judge Parker than I have had about anything in 18 months. I mean, we moved business into Maine. I got nothing. But Judge Parker, we put it back in the paper. So, I mean, the paper is a model that works, and will it change and will it evolve and might it go digital? You know, it might do any of those things, and what we're trying to do is restructure so that we can support a quality newsroom, and part of that means cutting costs. We all got fat in the happy years that I tragically missed. But, you know, <laughs> in, you know, 1975, when Ben Bradley was running the Washington Post, as the editor, and we broke Watergate, we had a newsroom that was less than half the size it is today. And that's not, I don't want to cut it. We want to preserve it, we want to keep it. But we built it up over the years. It's a privilege. For a while we had, you know, we would have days where we had two reporters reviewing the same movie. And I went to an, elder, an elderly home recently, and one of the ladies said, I really liked it when you had two reporters covering the same movie, you know, because I got two different views. I'm like, we're just not in that world anymore. So part of it is just disciplined cost cutting and then investing in new revenue streams and trying new things. Now, I have lots of questions still, but I want to give people in the audience a chance. Does anyone have a, a, a question that doesn't involve Judge Parker? <laughs> yes. I think you're supposed to. It would be helpful if you go to the microphones so and if you could just say who you are. Hi, I'm uh, Nate Lowenthal. Um, with a lot of the change that's happening in various businesses, people kind of talk about, well, it'll reach equilibrium eventually. You know, the market will sort itself out. And you guys are kind of saying that, too. A model will emerge that will support the kind of journalism that people, you know, are willing to pay for. But I worry about kind of in the short term, because investigative journalism plays such a critical role as a public good, you know, it's, it's just, it doesn't seem okay. Oh, for a couple years, we're just going to have to suffer without much investigative journalism. That strikes me as somewhat problematic. So, I wonder what you guys think might fill that gap in the short term. Well, for, yes, for, to be fair, I don't think Catherine said that. No, no, but I, I, but I know what you mean. That, and, um, Norm, do you want to take a crack at that? Well, I'm actually least concerned about investigative journalism because I think investigative journalists have always been driven by a passion other than the kinds of big budgets and big support that, um, that has been afforded by many newspapers. Cy Hirsch did me lie on his own, and it took him a year to get it published. Uh, uh, there's a great biography of I.F. Stone that's just been published, and uh, I, I, I got a subscription to I.F. Stone's Weekly from a friend of the family when I was 16. That's what got me into into journalism, and uh, you know he had a he was a blogger, I guess, who actually cared about documents, and he had a, he got his circulation up to about thirty thousand, and was able to to you know survive on that, uh, not not happily, but I'm, uh, but um, I think in fact investigative journalism is one of the things that um, the net does really well, and there are all kinds of people who are exposing stuff all the time. Um, I'm really more concerned about really solid coverage of communities on a day-to-day -day basis by staffs who, who cover things that people really just need to know what's going on in their communities. 
And that's what I think is really the casualty that I, that I worry about in the media. Uh, uh, did you have a follow-up? Well, I mean, it, you know, you can't afford to have a bureau in Baghdad, right? I mean, it's not, it's not just the bloggers who can read a lot of documents and search through them. It's people who can actually go and do extended stories. And, I mean, a lot of people do it out of the goodness of their heart. They still need to, you know, to eat, so. I surely, if this whole problem is going to be solved in a couple of years, we can manage for that length of time. I mean, it seems to me I've spent a couple of years already on panels <laughs> about the future of newspapers. Um, this is the real growth business, these yeah. panels, I think. <laughs> um, any other questions? Anyone? Anyone, anyone, anyone? OK, I'm going to ask a question. Um, uh, does anyone here get the print edition of the New York Times? Oh, oh, I didn't mean it for, OK, excellent. <laughs> hey, this is great, OK. Tomorrow, the New York Times will announce, this is the made up part, that they are stopping the actual print edition. But for $400 a year, you get the whole thing online. Who in this audience would pay for that? Probably. Well, Jim, that's not so bad. Jim, I think you missed Catherine's point. Your point was, of, of, you, is the revenue today is in print. The revenue is going to transist maybe over three, five, ten years. To but you'd have to be a, a fool to do that. It might be, and certainly I'm not suggesting that. It might be that in two years you would decide not to print the least profitable daily edition, Tuesday or Thursday or whatever it is. My proposition to you is the only way that's possible is if you sign up your loyal readers as electronic customers. And then you can proceed with the transition, however that transition is going to work out. But if you own the print franchise, and Amazon owns one little piece of the electronic franchise, and you're giving it away online, that's another piece, and iPhones have another piece, that is not, I submit, the way to prepare for that kind of a transition. But do and that's you think the mistake that 10 years everybody's... from now, when we're on this panel, yeah. 10 years from now, that there will be a print edition of the New York Times? I think her job is to hedge against all of those possibilities and to be as open-minded as she is about all of those possibilities because I think what she's got to worry about, what the New York Times has to worry about, what the, you know, you know, what the local newspaper in, you know, in Wilmington, Delaware has to worry about is do I have a relationship with my customers? Do they think both in terms of advertising and the journalism, that I'm giving them something that's worthwhile, that is branded, that is unique enough so that they'll keep uh, buying it. I was being interviewed by a, a reporter from uh, Newsweek a couple of weeks ago. You're going to love this. Um, and it was a young reporter for the online edition of Newsweek. And she says, what makes you think anyone's going to pay for content? And I said, well, it may surprise you to know that I, I think about a million eight hundred thousand people actually this week went and paid for your magazine. And she said, they did? <laughs> well, that's, the, I mean, we, that's what we're up against here. But the way to get that transition is to start them, uh, is to just do everything you do should be to emphasize the value of your content, even if you're just charging a dollar, two dollars. I think there's significant revenue to be made online. But the more significant upside revenue of going to an online, uh, the hybrid model, is in uh, the revenue for print. It'll enhance your print so, revenue. It's happened at every newspaper now, that's done it. <laughs> 10 years from now, will there be a New York Times and Washington Post on paper? I, I, if you asked me to guess, I'd yeah. say it would not shock me to see that they print the Sunday edition only, but that they have customers who are getting their Washington Post or their New York Times the way they want it, however they've chosen that they want it on some device that we've never heard of, on Kindle, online, who knows. But if, you, if, you, if you're the steward of that franchise, what you have to be open-minded about is making sure that however they want it, I'm going to be the, pers uh, the person responsible for delivering it to them, for employing really good journalists so that I keep what's special about what I do, and whether it's delivered in print or not. You know, uh, the woman that you held um, at Dulles Airport, the question I think you're asking yourself is, well, how am I going to help her daughter? Yeah. 
how's she going to get? Is she going to you know, be tearing through the Sunday edition of the paper looking for that? How am I going to keep that customer? But I think part of what it gets at, I think people make a mistake when they think that they're completely fungible. The newspaper and the web, they are completely different experiences, and we all know that, I think, in the way that we use them. The average reader of the Washington Post, and this is just us, not other newspapers, spends 40 minutes a day with the daily newspaper and almost 60 minutes on Sunday. And online, it's much shorter, right? People, I remember I was talking to a student of um, Al Hunt's class at, for Bloomberg, and I asked the kids, so how, tell me how you get your news. These are all journalist students, so presumably they're interested in news. And one <laughs> woman just completely, to me, gave it away. She said, well, in the morning I, I wake up and and I glimpse at my headlines on my iPhone, right? It's glimpse. I mean, I think people use their mobile phone for headlines. They go online, they, they scatter around, they go to aggregated sites, they jump into an article, they jump out. I think there are different experiences. Will the technology evolve? It is evolving so fast, and it's amazing. It's not just Kindle, it's, you know, the Hearst first paper. It's all of these entities out there. And so something might well come along that replicates what newspapers do well, and I think that's what at least I hope as a, somebody who cares about news that something like that will come along, but it may not be the printed product. Um, it sounds to me like this woman spent her entire 60 minutes trying to find the Metro section. <laughs> and and that, that's one of the things. That's not one thing we do well. No, right, that, well, it's one Sample of the. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Um, let me start Would with. Would you mind identifying yourself? Stan Kritzik from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Let me start with a very brief story and then I'll ask the question. Um, I am the world's smallest shareholder in Berkshire Hathaway, just to set the level. <clears throat> but my wife and I go to the meeting, uh, annual meeting every year because uh, she used to live there. And Warren Buffett's sidekick is a character named Charlie Munger who's in his 80s. So the question was asked of Warren Buffett, you own the Buffalo whatever, and it's losing money, are you gonna get rid of it? He said, no, I'm gonna keep it uh, because we don't get rid of our losers, we give them a chance. And then he said, Charlie, you have anything to add? And Charlie said, yeah. If the internet had been invented first and someone had, from their office had come to us and said, we have an idea to start chopping down trees, turning it into paper, putting ink on it, wrapping it up in bundles, throwing it into trucks, taking it out in the snow and throwing it out on the sidewalk, he said, we'd think they were crazy. So here's my question. <laughs> Washington Post, if you were online first, would you go into the print business? I think at this juncture we would because it's incredibly valuable to be able to reach people in their homes. And we know, our research shows they spend significant amount of time with our product. We have over a million readers for the daily printed product and over two million on Sunday. And on the web, we have 10 million unique, 10 million unique visitors. And it's great and it's growing by leaps and bounds. But at you least at this, parts. sorry, you online. Have a lot of parts growing. Yes. Sorry. Um, but print is still very, very strong, and as Steve said, it has the bulk of the revenue. So it may be that you're navigating this bridge where there is a point in time at which the print is, has the bulk of the revenue, and over time the next generation may not want to print a product, in which case certainly it does seem arcane to be doing this, you know, driving down streets and throwing papers out there. But it's still very valuable, and the advertisers want to reach the eyeballs, and people engage with their newspapers. They care about them. That's why they care about Judge Parker. They really care what's inside, and maybe they're going for the crossword puzzle, or maybe they're going for a story about Baghdad, but they're engaged with the content. Let me change the question slightly a little bit. Um, Norm? Bloomberg was first online. <clears throat> Would you start a Bloomberg newspaper today? <laughs> Let's just talk about the Bloomberg magazine. Yeah. We, do have, a magazine. we have a magazine that's control circulation, um, and uh, we have a syndicated content um, business where we try to get our stories in t picked up by newspapers because it's um, we... We love to see them read in newspapers. Um, and I, I think it would, but you know, we have one shareholder and uh, he so far has not expressed much interest in wanting to own a newspaper. But there's another good example, which is Politico. The Politico site started online and then they started a newspaper, newspaper. and they're making money in their newspaper. 
Oh, I didn't realize it. It has an impact. Oh, you know? that's interesting. People, sometimes they say, I want to get something published in the Washington Post. We say, well, how about we'll put it online? They're like, no, no, I want to be in the printed edition. It has an impact. I thought it was very interesting that you chose to, um, to run that lengthy murder story only online. Mm -hmm. um, Lisa, this is a two-parter that the Washington Post ran a few weeks ago about a, a murder of, uh, of someone in Washington and the, 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 the people accused of covering up were about to come to trial. And, there was a, uh, a lot of debate online Did it get a lot about of people. Traffic online? It got a fair amount of traffic online. We also got a lot of reader anger that it wasn't in the paper. And I think what we learned from that experience is our readers don't like being forced to go online. They want to be able to choose. We did the opposite with Chandra Levy, the summer intern who was killed in Washington. We published a 13-part series in the paper, and we got a lot of grief for that. So I think you know we're all learning, and experimenting. Wait, was it? It was online also. That was both. Right. So, what, what, what did they give you grief about? Well, they thought it was, it was sort of parts. too long. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but they spent too, too much, much about a story that had already too been much time a lot in the print about. edition on this. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, um, uh, uh, Jeff Jarvis. I'm, I'm I think? Jeff Jarvis. Okay. Um, I'm running a project at the City University of New York Graduate School of Journalism, uh, funded by uh, Knight and McCormick, and we're coming back here in August. Lucky me. Um, to try to present fleshed out business models for the future of news in a metro market. And I'm filled right now with factoids uh, 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 like this, you know, little tweets. Uh, one is that Russ Stanton, the editor of the LA Times, said last December that the online revenue of the LA Times.com advertising revenue was sufficient now to cover the payroll of LA Times print and online. That's a glimmer of an LED at the end of the tunnel, I think, that says there's a the vision of uh, a sustainable news organization from online revenue. And there's lots of caveats, I know, but let me keep going one more. Uh, the, to, to Norm's point earlier, the Telegraph in London last year made a third of its profit, granted other profits were changing, but from e-commerce. The Telegraph is the leading retailer of hangers to people in the UK, <laughs> hangers. My theory is that conservatives like to hang their clothes neatly. The Guardian <laughs> readers, my friend, just put their jeans on the floor and it's fine. <laughs> I think, though, that the, that the discussion has been filled with too many anecdotes like that, too many one-liners, too many lines about <laughs> revenue lines, and not about the P&L. And, and, and you've made the point about, about judicious cost-cutting, but I also think that the perspective to look at this from may be that of the startup, who doesn't have the legacy to worry about, and can ask that question you were just asked, Catherine, afresh. And, uh, and, and I, because you know what's happening. You got Craigslisted, newspapers did, by Craigslist in classifieds. I was talking to a major retailer last week whose main concern about newspapers' health is only the distribution of their circulars. And it's not hard for me to imagine Murdoch coming along and taking the coupons and the circulators, circulars and Craigslisting us on distribution. And it's also not hard to imagine someone coming along, young person, or old, but a bunch of people, and they can Craigslist the newspaper on editorial too because they don't have these huge structures and they can build it differently. And that's what's happening. And I think we have to look at this discussion from a zero base up because the other industries are, everybody else in this world is, and we've got to rethink the news business based on the new realities of media, the new realities of this economy, the new realities of competition, the new opportunities online to do things collaboratively and efficiently in new ways. The discussion too much is about, well, we used to have this in the old world, so let's see if we can't move it over to the new world. It's a new world. We have to rethink it from scratch. So it's not a question, well, it's just a diatribe, but I'll... Uh, let's start with Steve. Other than the obvious response would be, what's your question? Um, the, um, <laughs> it's like a blog, Steve. Yeah. Got... I, you know, I, I've heard you give that speech before, and since I'm not, I don't have to be on the defensive about this because I'm not a newspaper publisher or an editor, but I will tell you that the idea that you don't think that, you know, uh, when Marcus gets brought into the Washington Post, or when Bill Keller and Jill are looking at you know, what's going on at the New York Times, the idea that you don't think that they are looking hard at every single cost, and you think they're just living in this old world, and they're not start, you know, it's nice phrase, ground up, you know, you know, you know, zero cost, whatever your other phrases are, but I think every newspaper is doing that, and I don't think that's the answer. I think it's great that newspapers aren't wasting money and they shouldn't waste money, but you can squeeze all those costs out. But the simple fact is when you take a story, I'll just take one, that the Times did the other day, I think it was the Times, about how um, 
the loan repayment plan uh, that President Obama put in place to sort of ease the mortgage crisis for people, how it's not working, and it's caught up in red tape. That takes a lot of, a lot of feet on the ground, a lot of work. We need that stuff. We need that stuff in every community. And you know, just giving a speech about how it's a new day and they have to start fresh is not very helpful. Uh, Norm? Well, if you need that stuff, that's, that's, that's not an argument for a business model. That's an argument for subsidized content. That's an argument for, for, for rich people who want to have foundations and could, or who couldn't get a football team. Uh, that's, um, that's an argument for all kinds of things, but it's not an argument for a business. I think that stuff's good for business. I think the quality of the Washington Post is the best business model the Washington Post can ever have. Uh, well, that's, that's, that's the altruism that is the flip of what Jeff was just saying that you were so critical of. Catherine? Yeah, I mean, I think from my standpoint, there's sort of two different angles. I mean, one is the business side, the business model, and I would say on that score, nothing is off the table. We are willing to look at everything we do every day. We constantly ask ourselves, if we were starting tomorrow, what would we do? Does it make sense to drive down streets? Should we? We are not wed. There's no sense of we have to be wed to our traditions at all. Um, and the journalists we have in the newsroom are excited about the new technology. We're not having to drag anybody into the internet. But I think part of the mistake that I hear a lot when I hear people talking is this sense of, old traditional media and new media. And in my view, it's journalism with new tools. And what we are doing is taking what we believe is our you know, first rate, amazing journalists and editors and simply taking advantage of the new tools and, and learning along the way. We're learning how do people use modal? How do we use Twitter? How do we use Facebook? How do we do these effectively? How do we reach people in ways that they want to get their news? And so, you know, and we, we know the model in print, so that's an easy one for us to do. And, and that's changing. But I don't think, I mean, there is no sense of, oh, you know, well, I mean, I made a crack about how I wasn't there in the days we were making a lot of money, but that's just a crack, you know. <laughs> Michael, you, well, oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, I was just, just to follow up on that. Um, I think it is going to be a very important question going forward about where and how you do um, long-form journalism that, that is in the public interest and how you disseminate it and whether you can come up with a charging model for it. Um, I, I think it was la not, I think it was 2007 when Rick Atkinson did his four-part series on IEDs that ran about 17,000 words in the paper. And I'm guessing less than one half of 1% of, of the print audience for the Washington Post read through that. Um, uh, could that have been put into a book that was put online and could you have found globally 30,000 people who would pay a few bucks for that? I, probably. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of choices that we're going to have to be making going forward because in fact what the technology does allow is there is a global audience for the Washington Post and for that kind of public service journalism. And that, that's, I think, what you were trying to get at with your two-part series on the murderers. Is there another way we can tell this story that may make more sense than the way we've traditionally done it? I think that's fair. Now, Michael, since you were a prophet before your time, PH, not obviously F, um, you get the last word. Great. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to end on a Pollyannish note. Suppose back when Catherine was practicing law and escaping the horror to come, someone had come to her and said, you know, in very few years, the Washington Post will be able to print itself and distribute itself for free. And that will be true not just inside the Beltway, but all around the world. I don't think Catherine would have said, Oh my God, that's a disaster. So that you know that it's basically a good thing, and we ought to celebrate it. <laughs> On that note, thank you. Thank you very much.